everybody. I'm looking forward to uh, tonight's lecture. It's going to be a great talk. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to have some housekeeping items um, before we jump in. So, um, so real quickly, I'm just going to go over a few things. All right. So, uh, firstly, you know, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's so exciting to see so many people here and I uh, take it to share this lecture with you. Um, I'm going to be turning over, um, you know, the conversation to Rosetta Walker, our speaker tonight. But before we do, I just wanted to say a few things. Uh, first, um, Arizona Historical Society's ma mission statement is to connect people to the power of Arizona's history. And so this is a great opportunity for us to share a conversation of different perspectives and to learn from one another. Uh, a little bit of information about the Arizona Historical Society. Uh, we're actually the oldest historical agency and we were established after the first territorial legislator in 1864. And, and I also want to inform you guys, we actually have seven different museums, one in Tempe, uh, one in uh, Yuma, three in Tucson, and two in Flagstaff. So once we do open our doors to the public, feel free to check out those different museums. Um, they both, they all of them uh, have, you know, a lot of really interesting and different perspectives of Arizona history. Um, and also this lecture that we have tonight is in conjunction with our new uh, exhibit, Still Marching from Suffrage to Hashtag Me Too. Uh, this exhibit was open in the beginning of March, um, only open for a few weeks before we unfortunately had to close our doors to the public. So uh, we are, of course, sad that we have to close our doors after such a short amount of time of having this exhibit open. But when we do open our doors again, I encourage people to jump in. Uh, this exhibit is um, centered around uh, the women's protest movements in Arizona. And so some information for you guys, some great um, new updates. We actually have some upcoming virtual events at the end of this month and into next month. Uh, next week, we have Women's Equality Day. Then on September 2nd, we have the five F's of Flagstaff with our curator in Flagstaff, Jill Hugh. We also have Colorado River Days and Flagstaff going on on the 12th and 14th, and then Monuments and Mor Memorials on September 17th. So please feel free to sign up for those virtual events as well and join those conversations. We would love to see you there. And a highly anticipated and very exciting news, uh, we have our brand new license plate available for purchase at the MBD. Um, this has been something we've been really excited to share with people. Um, if you want to purchase this uh, license plate, it is $25. Um, you can also do a customized um, tag uh, with an additional fee. So uh, check that out uh, at the MVD, and a part of that also comes to us. And in other news, um, we wanted to kind of just plug our membership at the Historical Society. So. Um, if you do want to become a member, some of the perks is that we have free general admission to each of those seven museums, 10% discount at our gift shops, and uh, a free subscription to our Journal of Arizona History. And a little bit of information about that journal, it is a quarterly journal, and um, you, know, it, you would be able to have a physical copy and an electronic copy of that journal. It features just different perspectives, um, journal articles, interviews, um, book reviews, all kinds of really awesome stuff, highly um, sought after and, and just really great information there. And last thing I wanted to say before we get started with tonight's event, um, after the event, please feel free to check us out on our website. Uh, that You can get some news information, um, information about our upcoming events, that's where we also have our digital hub for any activities for any families out there with young kids, as well as longer form blog posts and um, an option to donate if you feel so if you feel so inclined after tonight's event. Um, that would be a great way to help us out and be able to continue to having virtual events for um, for our community. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn over our tonight's conversation. Uh, to Rosetta Walker. So let me go ahead and grab uh, Rosetta Walker's presentation. All right. 
Sorry, one sec. All right. Rosetta, go ahead. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight on this wonderful Arizona summer evening. Uh, my name is Rosetta Walker. I reside in Tempe with my husband and my daughter, and I've been an Arizona resident for 25 years. I'm a member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe in South Dakota, and I live here in the Valley. I'm a community volunteer, an advocate, and I don't like to coin the phrase, but they call me an influencer in the Native American community. I've been a steadfast advocate of the missing and murdered indigenous women um, movement that has been across the United States. And here in Arizona, I was one of the grassroots advocates when we started to go to uh, hearings in the Arizona State Capitol in 2019. So I attended hearings and I was present at the signing when it went into law signed into law in August of 2019. So I show support to the victims. I show support as being an advocate for missing and murdered indigenous peoples. And I do this in hopes that I can bring attention and bring about change. So let me first explain what an advocate is to me. So being involved in your community and putting forth effort to make change in your community and being a liaison between organizations and the public. That is what advocacy means to me. And that can be anything. It can be being a museum member at the Arizona Historical Society. You are being an advocate when you tell people about the museum, when you invite people to come to community events, when you participate in the events that your museum conducts, you are being an advocate for that for that museum. So it's as simple as that. It's as simple as being involved with your community and wanting to see the betterment for your community. So I am been a volunteer member of several arts organizations here in the Valley. And I also partner with various nonprofits here in the Valley that um, help with the community, with our Native American community, either with housing, with homelessness, with community advocacy and education. You know, we, we do it all. And some of those nonprofits you can, you know, look up for yourself, but you know, the Phoenix Indian Center helps out Native American Connections, the Phoenix Indian Medical Center, you know, these organizations, they provide scholarships, they help with education and community awareness. Now, the other chapter that I have in my life is I've been a public speaker for a little over 10 years. And I speak with Mothers Against Drunk Driving at their victim impact panels. And that is to bring about awareness on the dangers and the consequences of drunk or drug driving. So I've been doing that for a little over 10 years now. And the people who come to those classes are court ordered, somebody's told them they had to come. So it's a different audience. Now, as a community organizer, I've also assisted with uh, Indian markets in the Valley. Um, the Herd Museum has an Indian fair and market. I've sat on their committees before, Pueblo Grande Museum that's been here in the Valley for over 90 years. They have an annual Indian market. But of course, those markets have all been either pushed aside or canceled due to this pandemic this year. But that's being an advocate, being a part of an organization, helping out, spreading awareness, and being a voice in the community. So in, next slide. In May of this, of 2019, Arizona Governor Ducey signed into law Arizona House Bill 2570, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Study Committee. This bill created the 21 member study committee, which consists of law enforcement, Arizona Native American tribe, tribal members, and also family members of the missing and murdered and additional victim advocates. 
More than four in five American Indian and Alaskan Native women are, have experienced violence in their lifetime. The U.S. Department of Justice has reported that in some communities across the United States, the murder rate of Indigenous women exceeds 10 times the national average. The proclamation shown on this slide is of the state of Arizona, May 5th, Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, which was signed into law in May of 2019. This shows our originators of the House Bill 2570, MMIW. The originator on the left is a former representative Winona Bonali, who's Navajo, and representative Jennifer Germain, who is White Earth Ojibwe. Now, when Winona Bonali decided not to re run for re-election, she graciously asked Representative Jennifer Germain to take over the bill and push it through committee and make sure that it got into law. So the bill actually started in 2017, and then it took two years of hearings and testimony before it actually became law. So that's just a quick synopsis of what I just told you. And it was um, during this time that I was attending these committee hearings and got involved in the grassroots level for the, for the MMIW bill. Um, it was word of mouth. It was advocates saying, hey, there's this bill that's coming up. It's addressing MMIW. Can you come down and show support? Can you, sh you know, come down and either provide testimony and we need to have you show up in the galley so when it's in committee, the representatives of the legislature can look up there and say, yeah, this bill has support. So that's what an advocate that's on my behalf, that's what I do. So we, there was a core group of us that just banded together and we showed up at every hearing. We did this on our own time, we we're all volunteers. Some people took off time from work to come and some people drove hours to come to these committee hearings because we had a right and a duty to get this, put into law, the statute put into law so that we could help our relatives, that we could help the indigenous women and girls and men, you know, we won't exclude men, that were being harmed. And this is information that just had to be made into law. So one of the um, longest days that I remember us having was on February 21st. And we were on the Health and Human Services Committee agenda and we all showed up and our little moniker that we did is we all dress in red because red represents the color for MMIW. So we would garner our red shirts, our red skirts, our red scarves and we would go down there and sit in the galley, gallery at the uh, legislature while the bill was being heard. What we would also do is we would show up and you could request to speak for testimony, to provide testimony. And you could request, um, you could use that request to speak function also to show your support just online. You didn't physically have to be there. So that longest day of February 21st is we showed up at 8.30 in the morning, ready for testimony, ready for us to be heard. And we weren't heard. We were the last item on the agenda until 7.30 that night. But we stayed there. We, we didn't back down. People didn't leave. And we showed up. We stood up. And we were brave and resilient. And they had the people, the women there that provided the testimony was heartbreaking. But it needed to be hurt. And that's why I stood up with them. So one of the original supporters, she coined us the OGs, the original group, April Ignacio. She is from the Tahana A'atam Nation. 
And she started her own group several years ago in Indivisible Tahana. And several years back, she went out and started her own collection, data collection on missing and murdered individuals on her reservation. So she interviewed hundreds of men and women in her community. She would sit down at their kitchen tables after driving hours throughout the reservation, after investigating, after seeing, hearing these stories of people that had gone missing, had never been investigated by the police. Maybe the family members had never even filed a police report, but that's the data that needs to be collected. And she started it her own self. So what we do then as this original group is this picture. If you could go back one slide. The original group there is um, Debbie Nesmanuel on the left. She started with her testimony and her mother was killed. And this was on the Navajo reservation when she was she lost her mother at age three. And then standing next to Debbie Nesmanuel is Winona Benali, the former representative who was the originator of the House Bill 2570. Uh, next to her, we've got Elaine Gregg, who's from the Tahana Autumn Nation, and she's standing there with her uh, young daughter, Bea. And Bea would come to our meetings too, you know, because this is another young lady who would drive up from down there on the Tahana Autumn Reservation. And Elaine Gregg would relate her story, her personal tragedy where her young daughter, who was age seven at the time, Rhea, in 2019, um, her young daughter who had gone to visit some friends down the road in her neighborhood, um, she was found raped and murdered in, uh, outside the home that she had gone down to visit to. So that's her personal testimony. And she stands up and tells her story because she's a very strong, brave woman. So next standing to her is our champion representative, Jennifer Tremaine. Then we have April Ignacio from the Tahana Autumn Reservation. Victoria Steele is our Senator and she resides in Tucson and that's LD9 and she was our bill supporter. We've got uh, Valora Imus, who's Hopi, and she's the director and founder of Hongwansi Consulting Services and provided victim advocacy service to the women there that provided testimony if they needed a shoulder or a hand to hold. We also have um, myself, this picture there, and the last member who helped out is Navajo Nation Council Delegate Amber Crotty. And she is also the bit, uh, started her own um, advocacy group on the Navajo Nation and is a member of the Missing and Murdered Diné Relatives. So these, uh, these advocates spoke with respect and their stories were heard. Their stories were very poignant and they needed to be told because that's the type of advocacy that was needed and necessary for us to get the bill passed. So next slide. So this is uh, our site and you'll see it once a year on May 5th is the Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And it's a nationwide event and we had a full day's event there. We had speakers, tribal groups that came and sang and various community members provided support and stories on how MMIW has impacted their lives. So the May 5th, we have our annual event, but of course May 5th, 2020 didn't happen because of course the pandemic. So we're looking forward to May 5th, 2021 and going forth with our day of awareness down there at the state capitol. Those events are all open to the public. Anybody can come and they're probably two or three hours long. We have various nonprofit groups that come out and support us and provide information to the public. So what is Arizona House Bill 2570? It's a 
very wordy, long, <laughs> uh, lengthy house bill, but all the words in there do spell out what it was, what it is doing. So the purpose of this created house bill is to conduct a comprehensive study to determine how the state of Arizona can reduce and end violence against indigenous women and girls, establish methods for tracking and collecting data, and review policies and practices that impact violence, such as child welfare policies and practices, and to review prosecutorial practices and trends related to the crimes of gender violence against indigenous peoples. All this information is online. You can look up the house bill and read it. There's a couple pages of it. And then it also spells out who are the people that are sitting on this study committee. Because when this bill was made into law by Governor Ducey in August of 2019, it created a 21 member study committee. And those 21 members of the community throughout the state of Arizona are then tasked with those responsibilities that are laid out there in the purpose of the committee. So the 21 members, um, we have, they have conducted uh, public hearings, public meetings, uh, information gathering sessions. And the first meeting that they had after the bill was signed into law in August of 2019 was August 28, 2019. That first initial meeting was at the Arizona State Capitol. The second meeting was October 29, 2019 in Tuba City, Arizona. And so we had um, advocates from the Hopi and Navajo tribe come to that meeting and provide testimony. So the meetings, the public meetings are meant as a sounding board. They're, they're open, the 21 members are there to collect data. And when we talk about collecting data, we're collecting stories if the public chooses to present stories. Um, some of the stories are heart-wrenching, but they're real and they're necessary. We had our last meeting December 13th, 2019 on the Gila River Indian community at the Rawhide um, Western town there. And then of course the pandemic hit and we haven't had been able to have any more in-person meetings. They're all now um, phone-in meetings or you can email information to the data collector that's assigned to this which is uh, Valora Imus from her consulting agencies. So I share information on my Facebook page about this. There's also numerous uh, national stories that are about the MMIW, uh, Arizona Republic, uh, Native American reporter Deb Kroll has written stories on it. And so you can find information out there. Anybody can look this information up. It's not like it's a secret society or anything. The thing is that this is a pandemic in itself. This is an epidemic that has been across the nation for decades. It's just finally getting the information. It's finally getting the awareness that it deserves. Some of these stories that we hear about women have been missing for decades. You know, talk about an auntie that went missing in 1970. And nobody ever said anything. Nobody ever filed a police report. And so now it's, you know, considered a cold case file. And so um, with the new forensics that's out there, uh, people can look it up. We can have DNA that we that may be a, helpful in getting people um, either identified if they're unidentified or at least have a family member give DNA so that they can get that information into the database. So the 21 members, they're from all different walks of life, but we've got um, four members of the House of Representatives <clears throat> who need to be far <coughs> indigenous descent. We've got four members of the Senate, the Attorney General or his designee, <clears throat> designee, the Director of Department of Public Safety, 
And we also have appointed members, county attorney, a victim advocate, peace officer who works with a federally recognized tribe, a representative from the Southwest Indigenous Women's Coalition, member who works with the Phoenix or Tucson Indian Center, a member who works with the Phoenix Indian Health Service. And then there's several other that are appointed. Then we've got tribal government, chief of police, social workers, and then other tribal dignitaries. So it's a very inclusive 21 members and I thank them all for stepping up and being part of this. So the next slide is just a quick snapshot of our bill sponsor, which is Representative Jennifer Germain, and she's Legislative District 18, which encompasses Tempe, Mesa, Chandler, and Ahwatukee. And she is a champion in my book, I tell you. She has done so much for, the, for us. So <clears throat> the next couple slides are just going to be statistics. And the statistics that have been um, public from different organizations that had done a lot of extensive study. And one of them is the Urban Indian Health Institute. And all this information, like I said, is it's all online. You can look any of this stuff up. The Urban Indian Health Institute uh, made a very good inclusive comprehensive data report uh, several years back and that's where all this uh, slide statistics came from. So what they did find out when they were doing the comprehensive study is that, that there's daps, gaps in the data that come in various forms. There's lacking records from the different law enforcement agencies that don't provide data and there's racial misclassifications. And I remember there was one point where Jennifer Germain, representative, uh, related a story where law enforcement only has two identifiers. If they find a body in the back roads of uh, Phoenix Alley or something, um, the Phoenix Police Department either marks you as black or white. There's nothing to denote if you're Native American, Asian American, Latino, nothing. So a lot of this data then that we're looking at and re-looking at, they have to go back to these cold cases and they have to look through them and see if there was anything identifying that they could maybe in fact have been Native American. So that's where this cold case stuff comes in. So this here, of course, in 2016, there were more than 5,700 cases of murdered or missing Native American women reported. And out of that 5,700 cases, only 116 of those were submitted into the database. So that tells you the great disparity to law enforcement and the identifiers there. And so that's why we're working closely. The study committee is working very closely with uh, tribal governments, uh, local law enforcement on re-looking at some of these cases and getting them classified correctly. So the other thing that was also pointed out in the report is that the men and women that have gone missing get missed in multiple ways, in multiple areas. They go missing in life when they're either missing or they're murdered. They go missing in the media, which means they're not being talked about. And like I said before, this has been an epidemic that's been going on for decades. It's just finally getting picked up in the media and being talked about. And it's also missing in the data because we just noted about the misclassifications. And of course, it's missing in the government agencies because if the data isn't there, the data funds, the grants that are being given to the different governmental agencies that can help, that can help the different um, communities. 
So what we've got then is this is another statistical slide from the Urban Indian Health Institute is I really like this one because it's a ribbon skirt and that ribbon skirt just says a lot. It, it spells out how we are viewed and how we just, we're invisible to people, invisible in the data, invisible in the media, invisible in a lot of different ways. And it's very sad, but our voices are being heard now. And thanks to the Arizona Historical Society for bringing me on and allowing me to share this information with you. And I know, like as I'll say before, you can find all this stuff online. It, it's not hidden. It's, it's out there for public view, public consumption. And hopefully you can become an advocate too. You know, advocacies and allies come in all shapes and forms. And you too can help out. So what we've conquered or what's come down and what's been the next best thing is in 2019 in November, President Donald Trump formed Operation Lady Justice in response to the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women. And on November 26, 2019, he signed Executive Order 13898, forming the task force on MMIW. So what that task force then is able to do with federal funding is launch different um, advocacy groups throughout the United States. So I think there's, there's nine centers that are being funded. And centers is, I mean, there are nine um, task force that are being implemented throughout the United States. And Arizona was very fortunate to get one of their, one of the task forces. And that is by presidential order. So that's very helpful, extremely helpful. And then what we've done is they've also been able to get funding and they have a cold case file, cold case task force that was set up and opened October, I'm sorry, August 13th, 2000, or yeah, 2020 on the Gila River Indian community that'll be housed at the uh, police department there in the Gila River Indian community. So these are great strides that are being made, but you got to realize that this is just data collection. We're just having people tell their stories because without the stories, there's no data. Without the data, there's no funding. Without the funding, there's no task force. So it's all hinged in together. And so we, we have to help our working groups. We have to help our task force. We have to have our listening sessions. And it's all hand in hand with local, federal, and tribal governments. Because we're working with 22 American Indian tribes here in the state of Arizona. So next, after we have Operation Lady Justice, you know, this information, of course, is online. You can call in and be on the listening session for any of these task forces that are across the United States. Um, there is one coming up here in the state of Arizona, Operation Lady Justice, and I, I believe it's, it's like in it next week in August. But, um, you know, I'm very thankful that some of these advocacy groups have gotten to this point because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time and information gathering that's spent that we get to this point that our voices are now being heard. So I appreciate yeah. everybody who has stepped up to do that. I really do. It's a lot of work. It really is. So now what we're going to do is we do have our cold case out there in the Gila River and you know, 239 cold cases. That, that's a lot. That really is a lot. You know, hopefully those families will get some, some justice there. 
So now um, we're kind of kind of wrapping up here, and I know a lot of information you may not totally understand, and and I'm speaking just from an advocacy point of view, but you know it has to start somewhere, and I've been really blessed to know that there are men and women out there that step up to the plate that offer information offer housing to these places, to these organizations that are helping out. So now the tremendous work that the tribal advocates, the legislatures and the community members come from across the state. They work very, very hard on our behalf. But the reason why we do this work as volunteers is to keep the victims of these horrible crimes in people's minds, lest they be forgotten. These four names stand out for me because they were very public, very public um, murders. And we won't forget them. They will not be forgotten. You may or may not remember, but Amanda Webster, who is a citizen of the Navajo Nation, at age 26, she was murdered in Kentucky. She was a welder. She was out on a job and she was killed in a hotel room. And that was in December, 2018. The trial for that gentleman or that, yeah, that person who uh, killed her is pending. Ashlyn Mike, Navajo Nation citizen, age 11, murdered in New Mexico. May 2016, her killer is serving a life sentence. Savannah LaFontaine Greywind, a member of the Spirit Lake Sioux Tribe, age 22, murdered in Newtown, North Dakota, August 2017. There were two people that were convicted of her murder. The first killer, which was female, was serving a life sentence. The second killer, male, is serving a 20-year sentence. Olivia Lone Bear, member of the three affiliated tribes Re reservation, age 33, Newtown, North Dakota. She's been missing since October 2017. Her case is still unsolved. So this is just a very short, short list of what they're talking about, cold case files, murdered and missing indigenous women. This is just four individuals that fall into that category. So like I said, I'm not an expert, but I'm here to champion the experts, to advocate on behalf of the families and to keep their names in the media and to help make change. I humbly acknowledge the men and women who are the trailblazers who step up and testify before legislature, legislature and share their stories in public. These are the real advocates and change makers. I'm here to help by sharing, by taking action and by making a difference. I believe that will end my presentation. If there's any questions, if there's any comments, I will answer them to the best of my ability. And like I said, I'm not an expert, I'm just an advocate. So we'll, we'll start from there. Okay, what do you have there, Allison? All right, well, thank you so much for that talk. That was incredibly powerful and we really appreciate everyone that joined us and uh, got to listen to um, all those, you know, very harrowing um, statistics and stories. Um, I do want to grab some of the questions that are from uh, our chat. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, grab a couple real quick. One second. So, okay, so a couple of questions that have come up. Um, you know, why are the families and victims so hesitant to reach out to law enforcement? I believe it depends on what if they're tribal members, if the crime happened on the tribe, 
there is a direct relationship between the Bureau of Indian Affairs and tribal law enforcement on jurisdiction. Um, a very, very horrible story that I heard when we were at, when they were collecting testimony in Tuba City is a young woman was um, dumped from a moving vehicle on the Navajo reservation bordering the Hopi reservation. And it was tossed up into the air who was supposed to respond because it was right on a, a county road. And so the Navajo Nation said, uh, can't do it, it's not our jurisdiction. Hopi tribe said, can't do it, it's not our jurisdiction. State had to come in and say, okay, somebody's got to pick up this body that's been laying in the road for like four or five hours. Oh gosh. It's a jurisdictional um, conversation. So that's why the study committee has members of uh, tribal law enforcement on their committee to have those conversations to see how that can better be handled. Thank you for answering that. I appreciate that. If anyone else has questions, please feel free to, to jump in the chat. I'm going to grab a few more. Um, so another question that we have. Um, you know, uh, what is the typical time to get a bill passed to become a law? I only have current knowledge of this specific bill that I've been following. And once it hit legislature in um, January, February 2019, it was very well received and had unanimous support in both the House of Representatives and the Senate when it came up in their committee hearings through the Health and Human Services Committee. And it passed unanimously. And that's unheard of. And so that, you can look at the time frame from February to um, May, when it was actually penned into law by Governor Doug Ducey. So what, four months? Okay. And they actually had the actual ceremony down at the state capitol in August of 2019. So another question that was posed is, you know, are things improving? So that with the statistics that were shown in the, um, the, uh, the graphic design, are things improving or do we not have enough data to show? It's a work in progress. It's a slow work in progress. It, um, it's the awareness, it's talking about it. We're making progress right now by talking about it. Um, unfortunately, what the progress has been hindered because of the pandemic, the pandemic with the stay at home, the men and women are staying at home with their abusers, the abusers are taking advantage of that and the domestic violence rates um, and violence is, is skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, people are losing their lives mm -hmm. over the pandemic and to violence with their abusers. Well, I think that definitely segues into the next question. What are some practical ways of us to being able to help and be advocates? Some practical ways is to learn more about it. You know, all the information that I gave can be found on the internet. The Urban Indian Health Service report, it's a very exclusive, inclusive report that you can download the data, you can extrapolate data from it. And um, just to read where the statistics have come from, you know, they, they reached out to law enforcement across the United States, Alaska, and ask them, how many cold cases do you have? How many native, you know, indigenous cases do you have? And a, a numerous agencies said, we don't classify them. That's where that data came in. It's like, well, what do you mean you don't classify them? It's like, well, you either you're black or you're white. It's like, well, what do you mean you're only black or you? Well, you know, you need to update your forms. You need to look at why you're only having two boxes to mark versus five or six boxes to mark. So it's a lot of work to work with your law enforcement 
but the conversation has to start somewhere. Gotcha. And then kind of a similar question to that is, you know, do you know why uh, forms have been uh, only allowing for black or white options? Is that something that's a thing of the past or is that still currently uh, a way of labeling cases? Well, I know that uh, the study committee has members of the uh, law enforcement on their study committee. So those conversations are currently being had right now. The, there's conversations with the Phoenix Police Department with different tribal liaisons in their law enforcement on updating their form. So I don't know if they're currently updated the form or the form is in the works or are they still working off the old form? I don't know. Gotcha. Do you know if, you know, if someone was a, a, a victim that is indigenous or you know, non-black or white, where would they be labeled in that then? Well, they're either black or they're white until they root through these cold cases and use the identifiers like maybe the victim's uh, driver's license had Native American as race on, listed on their driver's license or they could possibly go by their name. You know, unfortunately that you have to go by name sometimes too, or if the family, a family member had in fact identified the body, claimed the body, and then they could, you know, ask them to, you know, well, what's the nationality of, of this victim? Mm -hmm. So what, what the hard part is, what I look at when they're going back through all this this information with the cold case files, these families are put through trauma again. You know, they're, it's like scraping the scab off an old wound and they're having to recall these events that were horrifying to them. But they can be brave, if, if they can be brave, they can, you know, help us out there. Um, another question that we have is, um, you know, why was the reason that they scheduled at 730 at night um, that day that everyone had to wait? Is, do you think that was an intentional uh, decision or it just kind of happened that, that way? From what I understand and from going to the different committee hearings is they have 33 items on their agenda and they don't take them in any specific order. And then it depends on the public um, hearing, the public testimony. And I'll be honest with you, the day that we sat in on that public hearing, the day that our, our item was on the agenda, they dedicated, or they chewed up, I should say, like two to three hours because the one item that was being discussed was vaccinations. So they had doctors there from Mayo Clinic. They had uh, women, mothers there that were providing testimony for and against vaccination. And that hearing just went on for hours. So what happens too is when they run out of time, when there's too much time given to a specific agenda item, then you actually get pushed off to another day or another week. So we were happy even though it was 7.30 at night, we were happy that we were on the agenda. You know, we stayed there till the bitter end, we did. And the committee members that there, I mean, they have to sit through there and listen to all the agenda items too. So it's not like it was just us sitting there waiting, you know, they're, they're there too. But when you're in there and having that last meeting you're meeting these same people when you're all out there headed to the restroom or you know getting a drink of water so you have those side conversations with that committee member and you know then you learn it's like well that you know testimony was very impactful so it's having those little side conversations that maybe wouldn't had happened had we been heard at noon yeah thank you for that that was definitely a you know, I don't think it was intentional. I honestly don't believe it was intentional. It was just the committee had a lot of items on their agenda. Certainly, it makes sense. Well, we definitely commend you for staying. That was showed a lot of fortitude. Yes, it was great, though. You know, I learned so much. I, you know, I learned all of that, 
all in four months. <laughs> That's awesome. I know that you kind of mentioned um, ways that we can be helping, but is there any other meaningful or impactful ways that we can all be, you know, working to better this cause and be able to, to get the word out? Learn more about it. You know, everything, like I said, is online. Just start Googling MMIW, reading the statistics, reading about different cases that had happened here in the state of Arizona and going to rallies. You know, we have a lot of different rallies that, that go on here in the Valley because it's hit home to a lot of people. It really has. And I commend the men and women who step up and provide testimony because their voices are being heard. Certainly. And yours can too. That's wonderful. Good advice to the, uh, all everyone that is listening today. And then, um, Kind of related to that, you know, um, a question we have in the comments is, is there usually advertising somewhere for bills that need an audience member to show up and, and how or slash when is that done? Well, I know that you can go online to, and I, I really hate to keep saying it, but um, all the bills that are being heard are online the Arizona um, legislator website. There is not anything currently on that's going to be heard in the legislature that is related to this because the, we passed our big bill and now everything's kind of calmed down, simmered down, and we're just working on this, the study committee. Gotcha, okay. Well, definitely a great place to look out, you know, in the future, if, if, if ever this is something that's going to be heard again, to go to, you said the Arizona Legislator website? Arizona Legislature.gov. Perfect. Okay, great. All right. Well, I think that is actually all the questions that we have in the comments. If anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to pop in. I'll give you a few, like about a minute left. But if that's, if that's it for everyone, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to you, Rosetta. It was wonderful to get to hear from more from you. And if anyone would like to um, learn more about uh, what you're doing, is there any you know, contact information or any other additional information that you'd like to, to let people know about? Well, I do have my um, contact information in the um, PowerPoint. If you want to just throw that up there, it's got my um, email. And yeah. So I'll go ahead and uh, throw that up real quickly so everyone can jot that down real quick. All right, so this is um, Rosetta's information. If any of you would like to contact her, um, there is the information that you need. All right. Well, I think that does it for tonight. I just want to say thank you to everyone that has joined us tonight. Um, I really appreciate everyone. This is a, a great way to learn more about, you know, what is going on and how we can be advocates. And uh, I appreciate everything that you've done for us and, and chatting with us, Rosetta. And um, again, thank you. Please join us again soon for the next upcoming talks. And uh, look out for any additional news on our website. And uh, just stay in touch with our community. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs> yes, thank you, of course. All right. All right, well, we'll see you guys. I appreciate everything. <laughs>